It's my pleasure to uh, welcome everybody um, to this lecture, which we've uh, sponsored annually in memory of my grandparents, Renee and Alexandra Bohm of Blessed Memory. And um, we are delighted to have tonight's speaker. And now I will pass it back to Drisha. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're very, very excited for, as was mentioned, the annual Bow Memorial Lecture this year with Rabbi Dr. Ariel Evan Mays. And the title of this lecture is As a Deep River Rises, uh, Jewish Law, Theology, and Environmental Ethics. So these are things that I know I'm very interested in, and I'm sure that many people here, obviously, <laughs> we had a very large response. So without further ado, please, Rabbi May. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here with everyone this evening. I am going to share my screen. I'm going to hope it actually works. And then I'm going to go like this. Hold on. How's that look? Beautiful. Fantastic. It's a Ukrainian forest for anyone who's wondering. Um, I never really understood Hasidism until I took a pilgrimage. Now, almost four years ago um, to Ukraine, and I went to all the spots that I had read about in so many books for so many decades. And the Baal Shem Tov used to talk about the forest being alive, and I never quite understood that, even though I grew up not far from Yosemite. And in Ukraine, they have these very long, tall pine trees that move back and forth. And it feels almost like the forest breathes. And it's an extraordinary experience, one that I've never been able to recreate. So I too would like to begin with my gratitude. Thank you to the sponsors for this evening's talk, for this very kind invitation, for the opportunity to be back um, at Drisha, and for the opportunity to think about some of the things that literally keep me up at night. Um, these are subjects that I believe are right at the heart of our current moment and will only increase in their dire nature in the decades to come. By this, I mean that we are, and I don't think this comes as a surprise to anyone here, in the midst of a major ecological catastrophe, manifest in extreme weather events, unmanageable fire, slow loss of biodiversity, depletion of resources, pollution of air, water, soil, prolonged droughts, and mass extinction. Other than that, things are great. Scientists concur that we are very much crossing the threshold after a threshold. If people have been watching this for decades, if you've been paying attention, there was this metric and this metric and this metric, and almost all of them are now in the rear view mirror as we barrel toward what we are told is a point of no return as systems are set into place in which ecological collapse will happen in uh, irrespective of what we choose to do entire ecosystems indeed are on the verge of collapse and as part of those systems of life not apart from them but a part of them we too are a part of that the reports of the intergovernmental panel on climate change have made these facts clear there are merchants of doubt who so dissent and try to show us that it's not as dire. No one really knows what's going on. These models are complicated, but at the end of the day, it is clear 3.6 billion people are already at risk of catastrophic impacts from human induced climate change in the next few decades. These statistics amount to the greatest moral and existential crisis of our day. One that should prompt us to consider our ways of acting, our ways of thinking, and our ways of being in this world. In part because of the magnitude and complexity, even cataclysmic reports and dramatic models don't seem to be motivating large-scale change. Climate change is what people describe in the world of the social sciences as a wicked problem, one with many factors and one without a clear single solution. The jury is out. If the science is in, how will we respond? In what follows, I'm going to make the case that we should be taking religion seriously in developing a strong and toothsome environmental ethic, one that can challenge our assumptions about this world. And at the same time, I'm arguing that Jews should take this seriously because all aspects of climate change 
pose a problem to be dressed, addressed from within our religious heritage, and not just to other Jews. Of course, I'm not talking about religion in the abstract. I'm a scholar of Jewish studies, a member of the Jewish community, an ordained rabbi, and I will teach from that position. And my argument is this, the sources of Judaism, law, philosophy, theology, and ritual have a particular voice to bring to this deliberation. So do the sources of other religious traditions, which can and should learn from one another, but they don't all say the same thing. If you go back to the Assisi Accords from the 80s and many other interfaith statements since then, there's a kind of flattening or sameness to religious teachings. Here, I think drilling in if you'll forgive that sort of like fracking metaphor, drilling in to the unique voice of each tradition is what we need to be doing. And they don't all say the same thing. Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, they have many local subcultures as well, which are in dialogue with the places that they have flourished. The leaders and practitioners of these religious traditions, Judaism included, have much to learn from indigenous communities and first peoples across the globe. This work is about looking deep into the past, examining Jewish literature, liturgies that are, sorry, literatures that are rooted in ancient cultural wisdoms from a particular time and place, whether that's the land of Israel from Babylonia or others, and the books and liturgies and poems and many other sort of creative artifacts that come in the wake of exile and throughout the incredibly creative time of our Jewish diaspora first thing that I need to say is that Judaism presents a robust normative system of obligations and rituals. That's halakha. These injunctions and prohibitions are linked to broader discourses of theological, philosophical, and intellectual meaning, called agada. These non-legal fields of inquiry that, and reflection shape the formulation of Jewish law, ensuring that the practice of Judaism reflects its deepest spiritual and ethical values, or at least it should. And both of these domains have something very important to offer contemporary environmental thinking, and building a bridge between them serves as a model for the integration of ethics and narrative on one hand, and law and regulation on the other. This process of integration gives theology traction as values are set into the idiom of action, of living in God's world with courage, with conviction, and with love. I begin with two relatively simple questions. Is sustainability incompatible with modernity, or at least with our version thereof? So much of modern thinking is really about the march of progress, the valorization of endless expansion and growth, and assumptions about the stability of our physical world. Across the past three centuries, however we want to date this, the rift between nature and culture, between our bodies and the natural world, has been amplified. Modern literature and philosophy tend to focus on the individual as a primary moral actor and agent, either abstracted from the world or overcoming the non-human world. As it pertains to the subject of ecology, I'm very much a subscriber to the notion that in many respects, post-modernity is actually a kind of hyper-modernity, super-modernity, if you will, a process that the philosopher and sociologist Hartmut Rosa described as social acceleration that's only increased in the past four decades. Things have been getting faster. Unprecedented advances in technical, temporal, social levels have left us as a species spinning. Yet responses grounded in individualism have failed to generate the collective action that we need. Our social institutions, which are grounded in particular kinds of ideologies and visualiz visions of globalization, tend to efface the local and the distinct, and they haven't caught up. This is what this, together with what Bruno Latour calls the vertiginous explosion of inequality. None of this is sustainable. So we need to be thinking bravely about how to remake social, economic, and intellectual systems in light of a different frame of mind, namely that we inhabit a porous and interconnected world, one that is united by a vast and complex interchange of natural forces that are not necessarily hospitable and which seem to become increasingly less so. This Earth system operates according to its physical and biological principles, but the unfolding of our planetary story is dynamic, and it's not always pretty. 
the active responses of the land can intrude upon our assumption that this world is static. If sustainability is in indeed incompatible with our type of non-isometric modernity, we need to be looking for new thought worlds, what the educational philosopher Rudine Bishop calls mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, sources that force us to reflect upon our situation. Those are the mirrors that allow us to gaze upon alternative possibilities, the windows, and eventually to walk toward new realities. Those are the glass doors. So the next question is also simple. <laughs> Why religion? How can engagement with religious traditions help us in developing a response to these very dire circumstances? And I'm not really interested in the fact that, wait, well, there are lots of religious people, so we must be talking about a religious response. The field of religion and ecology and many of its different isotopes really comes out of Lynn White's, um, Lynn White Jr.'s 1967 indictment of religion as a cause of the climate emergency. Um, if you haven't read that essay, I'd recommend that everyone go out and do so. Um, Lynn White talks about the Judeo-Christian heritage, which I have no idea what exactly that is, but his accusations have been cited in thousands of times in the decades to, that follow. Um, all of which have kind of set religious thinkers and practitioners back on their heels. He describes, whether it's science or capitalism or any other modes that we inhabit the world with, he understands it to be um, linked to a vision of a, um, a world in which human beings are at the very top of the celestial hierarchy, topped only by God, who is transcendent and not really involved in all of these other things that make no sense once you start to look at Jewish sources. Now, some people in response to this have kind of doubled down on attempting to utter, undercut the science of climate change. That's not a response that particularly interests me. Others have attempted to green ancient traditions through reinterpretation, showing that values like sustainability or whatever um, have been there the whole time, but they've really just been ignored. Another is another approach is mining religious literatures, and here I think the uh, the metaphor is apt for notions analogous to contemporary environmental keywords. Um, how do you say stewardship in Jewish, for example? And they generally come down to one of five topics: creation, tikkun olam, shmita, tsar bale chayim, not causing undue suffering to animals, and bal tashchit, don't waste stuff. It's all good, but these approaches do little more than to repeat established paradigms without offering alternatives. And I think we need something braver and something bolder. And that's the deeper work of exploring traditional sources with an eye to alternative modes of theorization and valuation that can unseat the assumptions that we have about our relationship to this non-physical world. So religions are large. They are transnational organizations that prompt huge numbers of people to work together. Sometimes this possibility for a collective action across continents is fantastic, but of course, we also need to be honest about the fact that religions don't always get along. They can also create disunity, fracture, and national self-interest. More importantly, religions help us conceive of obligations toward future generations, a very thorny issue in Western philosophy and ethics. But religions can help us think beyond our very high capacity for epistemic opacity. In simpler words, the ability of human beings to pretend that we don't see a wall until we quite literally smack into it. More importantly still, religious literatures and rituals represent alternative modes of moral reasoning and value assignment that offer an alternative to our current economic systems. One place that we see this is the concept of the sacred. This is pointed out by Amitav Ghosh in his fantastic book, The Great Derangement, and furthered by Moshe Halbertal, who argues that in classical Judaism, something is holy if it is beyond, and this is his formulation, beyond the range of human instrumentalization, if it can't be used for extractive personal or material benefit. The Sabbath holy time because we don't use it for our own interests. The holy space, the Beit HaMikdash, maybe the temple, maybe um, the synagogue or other things that we have demarcated as holy are places that we can go, but we are not the owners. Holy objects are like tithed produce or things like that are things that we can engage with, but we do not bring to the market. They cannot be instrumentalized. A conception of the sacred of the non-human world should bring us to think about limits, 
obligations, responsibility, and connection. And it's precisely the fact that Jewish religious thought has pre-modern roots that it permits us to challenge our paradigms. Wittgenstein once said, or he wrote, probably said it on many occasions, that the purpose of philosophy is to lead the fly out of the fly trap. So I think the same is true of religion. It helps get us unstuck. It helps us see that we live in boxes, but we do not necessarily need to live in boxes. Jewish thought has a long tradition of grappling how to incorporate the findings of science, and the exchange rarely favors one extreme or the other, and many different kinds of synthesis have been advanced. Here, I think that religious communities model cultural expression through interdisciplinarity in which sciences like botany and chemistry and biology and geography and mathematics go hand in hand with aesthetics, philosophy, humanities, theology, and law. Classical Islam is one good gold standard for this, and guess what? Maimonides is another, and there are many within our tradition too. These disciplines may have different domains of authority, but they inherit a shared realm of mind, body, and heart. So scientific information and method are critical for understanding the mechanisms of climate change, and they'll help us with solutions. But at the same time, an ideology in which all questions can be answered by science, what Pope Francis called scientism, can't provide us with a robust ethical framework, nor can it help us dismantle the economic, philosophical, and social structures that govern so much of our world. So science should be able to critique religious sources, but religious modes of ethical reasoning, evaluation, and narrative myth ought to be able to return the favor. In academia, in interfaith work, we often talk about building bridges. In a famous essay, Heidegger describes the constructive power of bridges in defining the experience of space and landscape. Like many things that he said, it is both morally problematic and also a little bit too clever to actually be true. Heidegger says, the bridge swings over the stream with ease and power. It doesn't just connect banks that are already there. The banks emerge as banks only as the bridge crosses the stream. So according to Heidegger, the bridge defines the space around it, turning distinctive features of a single landscape into opposing banks. Now, I think we all know that bridges come in many different forms. Some connect through exclusion. Some are one way. Some are hulking steel cabled monuments to industrialism. But it takes care to build bridges that, well, connect rather than divide. Religions don't just help in this bridge work. And here I think Judaism is a particularly helpful example. We can build different kinds of non-bisecting visions, ways of looking at the world and the many and various disciplines that must be brought to bear in the study of sustainability so that they're not just on the opposite banks, but they are integrated within a single, delightfully marshy landscape of possibilities. I'd like to point out four specific issues and themes that demand thinking across fields and that I think Judaism will be particularly helpful for thinking with. First, we need to confront the magnitude of the catastrophe and the urge to solve it with technology. We often talk about running out of time or acting before it's too late. It's so much harder to say that in some ways maybe it is too late. Tragedy and apocalypse are no stranger to religious thinkers, to indigenous thinkers, or to Jewish thinkers. For many, the world has already ended. For black theologians writing in America, the enslavement of the Africans was the end of a world, one that happened more than once during the century and a half of oppression and murder that came even in the wake of the 13th and 14th Amendments. Plenty Coup, a Crow chief, is said to have explained, exclaimed, when the but when the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground and they could not lift them up again. After this, nothing happened. To build on the clever and problematic work of William Gibson, who said that the future is already here, it is just not equally distributed. I think that the end of the world is already here, but that ending is not yet evenly distributed. So the first step in meeting the present moment is not to rush to solutions, but to recognize the situation for what it is, examining our current ecological tragedy and the my tragedies of mind, action, and systems that have led us to the situation, and of course, not to stop there. 
Judaism has deep resources for thinking about this. Two of my favorites are on the screen before you. When I talk about Judaism and climate change, I don't start with Genesis anymore. That was a decade ago. Now I think about the um, verses that grapple with the destruction of the temple. The first from Jeremiah is voiced by individuals who are lodged in the seat of power, who can't conceive of destruction. God won't bring down God's own house. By refusing to acknowledge the frailty of their situation and the precariousness of this world, individuals like this can't address the problems that are really the heart of the matter. The second verse from the book of Echa or Lamentations bespeaks a yearning for redemption and deliverance even amid the devastation of Jerusalem. The totality of destruction is inconceivable precisely because the speaker can't face it without looking for a solution that comes, well, as a kind of deus ex machina, a god from the margins coming in to save the day. Jewish environmental thinking in our, in our age begins not with the appreciative romance of creation, but with those hardened descriptions of exile and the failures which, and failure with which the prophetic books are filled. We turn to the works of Maimonides here, a great medieval jurist and theologian who highlights the values of responsibility when we are confronted with difficult and even seemingly imponderable situations. Maimonides demands accounting for our actions. If we simply say this is the way of the world when something happens, whether it's collective or personal, he describes it as a kind of cruelty. Ach zariut. We need rather collective and personal ethical response. Of course, some versions of this theology have a kind of naive cause and effect. My car is crushed under a tree, so I must be a sinner. But on the other hand, what I think Maimonides is calling us to remember is that the world around us is very much shaped by our actions, and that inattentiveness or non-attention to that can lead to devastating consequences, and it does not allow us to get at the root of repentance, what he calls the derech of tshuva. Modernity has taught us that the world is stable. It's a kind of old Aristotelian trope, um, but the world doesn't seem to be very stable. One very interesting and important um, early modern rabbi who most people here will probably know for his commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, Moshe Isolas, in his Torah Ta'ola, that's well, not his greatest hit, but certainly a great hit and a remarkable book. One of the themes of that book is that the world is coming to an end. He's thinking mostly in terms of various cosmic cycles and trying to understand the nature of religious living on the edge of destruction, and that, I believe, is a helpful pattern for us. We might also turn to the works of what the Kabbalists call Torat Hashmitot, the notion that the world shifts and changes in enormous and sometimes unthinkable ways, and it is always rebuilt. Zohar tells a story about Malke Edom that we just read about, about the kings of Edom that existed before the world in the Zohar's retelling, who, because they fight with each other and are more interested in their own selfish interests than in the endurance of the world, they cause a kind of cataclysm that causes the world to fall apart and is then remade. I wonder who in our day would step into that breach. Now, uh, a mindset of crisis, and here I think that Maimonides is not calling for that, does not spur individuals or societies to really think deeply. Um, presumably this has never happened to anyone on this call, but if you've ever been in a fight with someone you, you love, it's hard to imagine moments like that that bring out the best in you. Paradigms of emergency or catastrophe tend to leave lead to evil, either, either conservatism or the rejection of change, to paralysis or indecision, or to massive change at the expense of those without a seat at the table. Both of these eventualities hamper our efforts to think through the challenge and respond to the challenges of climate change. In this note, I would really commend the work of Kyle White, an indigenous philosopher and scholar of environmental studies, who has demonstrated the inadequacy of what he calls epistemologies of crisis, which are those seismic moments in which all of our way of life is threatened and we fall back on the very tools and structures that have brought us to that point, as opposed to epistemologies of coordination namely ways of knowing the world that emphasize the importance of moral bonds, of kinship relationships, 
for generating the responsible capacity to respond to constant change in the world. That's the end quote there. Coordination, in other words, enables us to search for answers and response, and that's exactly what Rambam is asking us for. So assuming that carbon emissions are not dramatically diminished, the question we need to ask is, how can we live together amid devastation? Like the Matsutake mushroom described by Anna Tseng in her marvelous book, it's a fungus that grows only amidst the rubble of a pine forest. We need to develop pathways of resilience and then at the same time to think together, how do we live together and create a better world? In this, technology cannot be the only answer. I teach at Stanford, I hang out with lots of people for whom thermal shields, carbon sequestering, terraforming, plastic val vacuums, geoengineering, all of these are the solution. I think that these treat the symptoms more often than actually getting at the deeper malaise. I feel very strongly that Judaism rejects technological determinism. Not everything that can be done ought to be done. I am guided here in two examples from our tradition. The first highlights the power of technology as a kind of graven or false god. This rabbinic teaching maps the yearning for technological mastery in order to stave off ecological calamity onto the story of Babel, long identified in our tradition as a tale that warns against hubris. Build higher, grow, hold up the heavens. If we perfect technology, technology, we can really have an ever-expanding economy somehow within a world of limited resources. We can hold up the very heavens that seek to come down. But technology can't change the fact that we and 90 to 95 percent of the species that have co-evolved with us can't fully live on the planet that we are creating. The second tradition deals with one of the best known Jewish legends, that's obviously the golem. After this beast, this creature is created, it grows and grows and grows until it's out of control. The owner erases the name of God from its forehead, but then the creature strikes the owner on the forehead in that very same place. This text from uh, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, cites in the name of his grandfather, um, doesn't emphasize the supernatural. It rather highlights the reflexive hazards of what the things that we create. For my generation, when I was growing up, that was Skynet and the Terminator franchise. For the next generation, I think it's just social media. It's this notion that the solutions mindset endemic to contemporary thinking can be a part of the problem especially if, it look, if it's about looking for a technological fix. Hanukkah, our fire story is not about Prometheus climbing up to the mountain to steal something that belongs to the gods, but about Adam and Chava receiving a gift of fire to help them live within the cycles and the complexities of a created world in which they inhabit. This is one version of the story of a kind of origin story for what Hanukkah becomes also, and I'll talk about that a little bit later also. So in learning to live with brokenness, to be able to carry these small candles or these small sort of interwoven Havdalah candles, which is the story too, um, of illumination into our world, I'm drawn to poetry. Poetry says what we can't say in prose. Jane Hirschfeld wrote this amazing poem called Azal for the End of Time. It's a requiem in which devastation becomes so unspeakingly great that death itself declares, now I too am an orphan. I'm also drawn to the work of the Israeli poet Zelda Schneerson Mishkovsky, whose writings celebrate the miracle of the ordinary. The heroes of her works are fish, butterflies, skies, and trees. Her poem, Ancient Pines, recalls the devastation of a landscape after the melting of the snows. She laments the destroyed interiority of the tree, doubly violated because they're not cut down gently and with respect, but in the throes of wanton destruction. That, she says, is murder. This poem startles us and calls us to remember that the snowy edifices of our world are actually melting, not just figuratively. 
Must more devastation emerge? I think not. The poets and the artists, claims Thomas Berry, can help restore the sense of rapport with the natural world. It's renewed, it's this renewed sense of reciprocity with nature in all of its complexity and remarkable beauty that can help provide the psychic and spiritual energies necessary for the work ahead. So eco poetry, much one that we, uh, something that we have much of in our tradition, is not just deep appreciation for the non-human world, but it's something that seeks to jolt us to attention, shaping our attitudes and changing our behavior, often with a kind of quiet appreciation of the ordinary. That indeed is the central lesson of Hanukkah. Donna Haraway, a philosopher and a biologist, has advocated for what she calls staying with the trouble, what Adrian Rich calls diving into the wreck, rather than looking away, rather than pretending it's not happening, rather than searching immediately for solutions, we must acknowledge that in some ways it is too late. The darkness comes. We are in December, a dark month. And yet, by leaning into that which is broken, by learning to live with a sense of an ending, we find the possibilities for change, for illumination, and for flourishing. One of the great Jewish creation stories is Shvirat Kelim, the breaking of the vessels, a story that describes God right, radiating sacred energy and light into a series of emanations, catchment reservoirs for this divine vitality. They become filled and overfull, buckling and then shattering under the weightiness of that radiance. They break shattering sparks or droplets of that quiet divine light throughout the cosmos. The project then of religious living and of our human existence is to discover those broken fragments throughout our world and with courage return them to right, their rightful place through action. Our willingness <clears throat> to be frank about the brokenness of our systems and the suffering of the eco world around us ought to inform our approach to environmental education and activism, shifting from a purely preventative mindset to one that grapples with equity, resilience, and change amid devastation. At the same time, we also need to be looking for what Krista Tippett calls the generative narrative of our time. How knowing that decay can lead to regrowth, brokenness can lead to flourishing. How can our present moment, this is the question, become like one of those beautiful and sad fallen redwood trees serving as a nurse tree for future generation? Forest fires cause mortuaries of trees, but they also cause nurturing. Okay, the mythic stories that we tell about land and about place and about our place in the cosmos is the second domain of thinking. We need to find this is a story about the generative narrative. I'll uh, make these available and you can read them on your own time. Um, we need to find new stories. We need new myths or better what the Zohar calls milin chadatin atikin, old new narratives. One possible potential myth that comes to us from the Jewish past is that of pantheism or panentheism. An ancient name for God is, of course, ha-makom, the place. While Judaism is not geographically neutral, it tells a much bigger story about connections to the particular place in a particular land, while at the same time, in certain, um, in certain features from within the Jewish theological canon, we talk about God in terms that would have been in abhorrent to those involved in the famous pantheism controversy of the 18th century. They're really simple words, actually. Alts is Gott. That's one early Hasidic formulation. Everything is God. Such myths, such ways of thinking, leave no room for a human versus nature binary or even a hierarchy. We are a part of an economy of life, of vitality, of breath, of sacred vitality, of circulated divinity that suffuses all aspects of the cosmos. It's not the end of nature, it's the end of nature, not in Bill McKibben's sense of the reach of our spoilage, but in the sense that the idea of nature is something external to us must be overcome in order to understand that we are a part of this beautiful, complicated, integrated fabric of the created world. 
we would do well to generate toothsome ethics grounded in this way of looking at the world. A recent, uh, sorry, a recent environmental philosopher has said that pantheism tells us that we need to, quote, be nature better. How might awareness that God is everywhere, expressed in all forms of life, as well as through the physical landscape of our planet, change our relationship to the non-human world? Another version of this re-envisioning comes from the great medieval book of mysticism, the Zohar, which is described stories of God and the world that are mythic, dynamic, imminent, and transcendent. They tell of a God that is male and female, one that is both finite and infinite, and one that is in need of human action. We human beings are described as the tenders of the sacred wells through which the water rushes into the cosmos, funneling, channeling that blessing into this world. Elsewhere, the Zohar describes King Solomon going into the Garden of the Song of Songs, plucking one walnut off the tree, and after contemplating the fruit and its many layers of shell and nut meat, anyone who's ever tried to shell a walnut probably knows that it's almost impossible and it takes forever, you come to see that all forms of life are intimately interrelated. So the interrelationship between these, the imbrication of the garments, link the inner and the outer and the outer with the uh, inner, but nothing is hierarchical in that sort of classical chain of being that we often think about. Like the infinitely dazzling and reflective array of jewels in Indra's net, it's a Buddhist symbol for the dependent origination and interinterpretation, interpenetration of all things, the Zohar's parable underscores that everything in this world is linked to everything else. Again, what if we were to think along these lines to generate an ethic or to generate economic policy? or to generate federal regulation. In both of these accounts, in the mythic and the panentheistic, the notion is that the world shimmers with divinity. I used this word for many decades, and then I read a book by the late anthropologist um, Deborah Bird Rose, where she describes the Yungu Aboriginal um, word, what's called biryun, or brilliance, as that which allows you or brings you into the experience of being part of a vibrant and vibrating world. So shimmer then is this kind of radiant quality. She also describes it as when you're etching a drawing and you've drawn the outside and it hasn't quite come to light yet, life yet. And then something happens as you apply color it becomes animated and vital. That is our world. It's a world that is invitational. It's a world that asks us for relationship. It's a world flush with ancestral power and flush with the vitality. Here, I think, is a great explanation of the way in which, if you read the Zohar, um, there's one place in the Zohar where nothing important happens, and that's the Beit Midrash. Nothing happens in the Beit Midrash. It all happens when people are along the way when they are arriving at a tree, a tree or a rock or a mountain or a stream, it's that encounter that allows them to rethink the text because text and landscape and selfscape all converge. Now, things that are beautiful are not always powerful. Destruction is a possibility. We need to be thinking about the land as an agent. In the Bible, God commands, but the land acts. If you read the verses about Shemitah, about the sabbatical year in the book of Leviticus, not as those in the book of Exodus, and not as those in the book of Devarim, of Deuteronomy. The land is the actor in the book of Leviticus. The land is a subject, nominally, grammatically, and also theologically. The world can and does flex, and it acts in response to our over-extraction from fracking and pit mining to industrialized agribusiness and air pollution. One amazing source from the Nativo Shalom, a 20th century Hasidic rabbi, goes even further, noting that if you read the story about the biblical flood, it's all in the passive it doesn't talk about God commanding this and that. In the Nativo Shalom, um, describes this flood as a kind of hashlacha, which in modern Hebrew means a consequence. It means something that happens that is directly linked to human action and to our lack of restraint. This is a really important way for developing a language for thinking about what Isabella Stengers and Bruno Latour and others have called the interruption of Gaia, a power that we must reckon with and that we cannot control. 
This mythic idiom helps us conceive of the data and frightening models of an Earth system that we have, in which a planet that was once thought of in terms of stable is volatile, and it's complicated. It's not an object. It's a subject. It's an actor. The focus on land and on place should also remind us to think that we need to think and lack, act locally while keeping our eye on the big picture. And I know that trying to do those two things together is kind of a hackneyed truism, but here's what I mean. Solutions from the top are very unlikely, especially in the political uh, current political climate of polarization. Local activism at the grassroots and the communal level seems like it has a much better chance of sparking systemic change. To a historian, this isn't really a surprise, but it is an important reminder to carry at the forefront of our consciousness. We need to do what Bruno Latour calls coming down to earth. Remembering that we are terrestrial beings. We are Adam created from the Adama. Created not just from one place, but from bits and pieces from all over the world. And we hold both of those together, a specific place and together with that, we are Terran beings that inhabit a planet. That's a complicated thing to hold together. And it's not just enough for individuals or communities to make small choices, but at the same time, we need to think with the land community. That's what Aldo Leopold calls it, the specific, the earthy, those who dwell upon the land as well as underneath it. As Wendell Berry says, like all other species, we must submit to the necessity of local adaptation. It's a great way of thinking about Minhag Hamakom. Okay, so, you know, as it says in the good book, Oive, what are we supposed to do with all of this? Part of thinking about the place of the human being um, at the local and the grander level means moving beyond a false dichotomy of human versus nature, of seeing ourselves as part of the house, the oikos of ecology, the network of connection and reciprocity and obligation that the connection demands. Here is the third domain of Jewish thinking that I think comes to the fore, a paradigm of kinship with the non-human world, of responsibility for and also connection with. In Judaism, human beings are, of course, described as gardeners and caretakers, rather than conquering and subduing the animals of the world, as one particular text in one particular interpretation would have it. We are at the same time called upon to work and to preserve it, as a kind of sacred trust. Rather than this vision of the pristine wilderness that has guided so much of the American mind, Jewish sources refer to paradise is one in which human beings live together with the flora and fauna within a single network. If the first story of Genesis puts human beings within a creative hierarchy, the second, the tale of the garden, imagines human beings within a terrestrial realm in which they're connected to the animals with a wisdom so great that they have been charged with naming them, the ultimate act of connection, rather than a kind of stewardship that is noblesse, oblige. I think here in Judaism, we find community with the land in conversation with its inhabitants and the web of reciprocity and mutual obligation as key to the divine charge. Maybe a revised anthropocentric focus of Judaism can actually be, as they say in Silicon Valley, a feature, not a bug, in the Anthropocene, in this time of human ascendancy and of human dominance, at least in terms of the way that we can shape the world. We are not the only world building creatures, of course, build beavers, build dams, moles, farm and stockpile worms, and termites can construct magnificent skyscrapers, but we do it at a scale and with a potential for destruction that is utterly unique. One daring Hasidic source from the 19th century perhaps a reflection of being written in Poland as it was just beginning to industrialize, describes the sense of imbricated community with animals as leading to a sense of responsibility, as an obligation before we are created. All beings, all kinds of life, according to the Talmud, are asked if they consent to creation. The mysterious us in the divine is not the royal we or the rabbinic tradition, um, the angels of let us make um, the human beings in our image. In this daring text, the sum totality of the symphony of creation, that is the us in all of its polyphonic and vast richness of that biodiversity. What's the upshot 
of that, of living in this world because human beings have, because the animals and the non-human forms of life have consented to that, consent triggers obligation. And it commands attention to our place in this more than human world. Maimonides argued quite clearly that the world and it's filled with everything that is filled with is not here for our pleasure. Everything exists for its own reason. The book of Job toward the end reminds us um, in the theophany from the whirlwind about the uniqueness of, hum of animal life, about the horse and the ostrich and the goat and the wild ox. These animals exist, says God. The horse, horses, the goat, goats, the ox, oxes, and we can only witness their mystery. We can only imagine what is there in there, what's called an umwelt their unique perspective and habits. Price tags are not a feature of that world. Jacques Derrida noted that the word animal is a stupid word. It's a stupid word that makes us stupid, feeding an ego-driven conception of humanity at the summit of creation and dividing us from all other non-human forms of life. Okay, we are a part of that and we are different than that. And yet at the same time, we are so richly interwoven that we are inseparable. But we don't encounter the sum totality of all life at every moment. Orientation, engagement begins with a single moment of encounter. As Zelda put it, Eineni ohevet et kola eitzim shave. I don't love all trees equally. The Talmud describes a story in which a rabbi asks, how do we bless the tree in front of us before we are standing? It has everything that it needs. The only thing that we can bless is that the engenderment of its own progeny on its own terms continue. We bless the tree that it may continue to tree. Martin Buber, the famous Jewish philosopher, wrote a book on, Jew on the dialogical encounter called I and Thou. His arch example is encountering a tree, seeing it as something textured, specific, and local, not the embodiment of treeness in some abstract sense, but as a very specific being, as a companion. Imagine if we were to turn this same attention to the non-human world around us, and indeed to the human world around us. Abraham Joshua Heschel was famous for having said, not that the biblical interdiction against creating an image of God is not because God has no image, but because there is only one image of God, and that is the human being that stands in front of you and the sum totality of a human life. Everything else pales in comparison to the infinite complexity of the human being. What if we were then to extend that to the non- human world. I'd like to jump here to the fourth and final category, which uh, an arena of contribution, which is legal and moral responsibility. Jewish tort law gives us a language. This is halacha, hilchot nezikin, for those who, who know, um, offers a language for ethics that are grounded in obligation. This is an important insight of the legal scholar Robert Cover, who notes that while American common law is about rights, which has a lot of rhetorical heft, it doesn't do something else, which is in providing for the material guarantees of life and dignity that flows from the community to the individual. That's Robert Cover. Whereas Jewish law thinks about obligation. Now, the struggle to develop an alternative language for comprehending and addressing the relationships between the economic structures and environmental exploitation comes in part because of the combination of the fact that there are so many trans-jurisdictional parts of this thorny problem, this wicked problem, um, but it also comes from the social default toward market individualism. Rabbinic law doesn't give us a wholesale transferable solution, but it offers a robust accounting of embedded duties within a society and commitment to other human parties as well as the non-human world. Obligations-based jurisprudence gives us a framework for shifting from a starting point of technological capacity or an economic advancement to one that demands focusing on the capacity of human institutions and human actors that can keep pace with our ability to harm and impact the world around us. Industry is not forbidden by halakha, even if businesses create a certain level of noise, air, or water pollutants, but communities and this world are meant to be livable. They're meant to be sustainable. They're meant to be useful for human and non-human sources alike. 
Now, I've spent a lot of time developing three primary categories for conceptualizing um, environmental damage into the and the human costs that come along with it, and I just want to put those on sort of broad strokes. One is ish, um, fire, which is a kind of category that's inclusive of all inanimate damage causing forces that harm individuals or property by motion by some sort of an external force. This provides a precedent vocabulary for speaking about a whole range of environmental pollutants, pollution, pollutants, caustic and toxic chemicals, carcinogens, and other kinds of harmful waste carried by the wind, those that leach into groundwater or are otherwise dispersed. A second, Bore is a non-mobile but dangerous object, quite um, easily read as encompassing hazardous materials and industrial waste, as well as more obvious corollaries like, well, open pit mining. There are two elements of this that I think are particularly useful for rethinking contemporary environmental law and ethics. The first is that rabbinic discussions, and anyone who has um, spent time with Baba Kama will remember this, Rabbinic discussions um, about Bohr consider the placement of liability if there are multiple individuals who share ownership of a pit, addressing questions of multiple or joint tortfeasors. In many cases, the rabbis hold both parties responsible, although if one owner fails to cover it up and the other partner encounters it without properly safeguarding the pit, the second is liable rather than the first. In a world of ever-increasing responsibility gaps, this, I believe, is vital. A second dimension of the doctrine of Bohr is its vocabulary for thinking about cumulative potentials of hazards to inflict harm. The seemingly silly example of the Talmud of pits within pits, right, pits inside other pits, addresses exactly this issue. Liability falls upon the individual who adds on that necessary measure, turning the pit from an annoying hindrance into a lethal object capable of killing an animal or a person. This is an excellent example for what Robert Nixon calls slow violence. The third category are damages caused by one's neighbors. These laws emphasize that you can't simply externalize damage to others and to the world as the cost of doing business. Industry has to be regulated and relocated, removed in order to prevent significant bodily or material harm to the people, animals, and physical world around it. Together, these, and to this I would also add Hashabat of Adal, I'll talk about that in just a second, provide us with a way of conceptualizing the damage caused by coal, smoke, open pit mining, radiation, plastic pollution, human-induced and exacerbated wildfires, and a host of other extractive or corrosive actions. What if we use these kinds of principles to regulate at the local or the federal or the international levels? Now, Hashavat Aveda is something I've thought a lot about. Here, the obligation to return lost objects is already in the classical rabbinic sources in, um, expanded to include saving the life of another person and saving their property or their field from inundation or flooding. As I watch islands disappear quite literally because of the polar ice caps um, diminishing and the rise in sea levels, I think about this all the time. Security, according to this, is something that we owe to others and that we must fight to fight for to protect for them. If we know environmental collapse can yield, and in fact it is yielding, major human costs, we must recognize that refugees will be an ever more present part of our world and that we ourselves may be among them. The Midrash here, as I come to a close, I just want to put this onto the table. Um, the Midrash here describes the callousness of the neighbors um, around those who went into exile after the destruction of the first temple. And, um, and according to, to this Midrash, more people die because they, those who are around the exiles refuse to help them, then are, then are killed by the actual destruction of the temple itself. So as a religious person, I am guided by the words of the noted theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel. Creative dissent comes out of love and faith, offering positive alternatives, a vision. The scarcity of creative dissent today may be explained by the absence of assets that make creative dissent possible. Deep 
caring, concern, untrammeled radical thinking, informed by rich learning, a degree of audacity and courage in the power of the word, the dearth of people who are rooted in Jewish learning and who think clearly and care deeply, who are endowed with both courage and the power of the word may account for the spiritual vacuum, for the state of religious existence today. I have a less dour vision of Jewish education than he does, and yet these principles still guide my thinking. The power to spark transformation, to levy critique, and to build alternatives is rooted in a sense of commitment to the past. When we are stuck, when our present is defined by stagnation and small-mindedness, we need to build bridges. We need to th highlight modes of thinking that spotlight networks of obligation. And to do so, we need theology, we need narrative, we need myth. We need to mobilize the full might of scientific craft, but at the same time, we need the humanities to blow wind into its sails and to set the proper course. And in this sense, we need each other in our local communities, in our communities of faith, across lines and intersections of identity. To be rooted in a place is to see one's grandchildren inhabit that place. Maybe that's New York, maybe that's New Jersey, maybe it's Berkeley. It's certainly the earth. It is our common home. It is our only home. Hanukkah is about rededication, about thinking about what kind of home we wish to build. In his peroration at the end of his laws of Hanukkah, Rambam tells us that the most important thing, the most important, the dispositive value if you have to make a hard choice, is that the Torah tells us that you make the choice in favor of peace. That is the foremost peace, well-being, and mutual flourishing. That is the foremost value behind which all other things must align. This requires us to build bridges between statutes and regulation and obligations and stories between religion and science, between the local and the global, between indigenous communities and multinational religious traditions, between activism and the academy. These bridges need to be supple. They need to be multi-directional. They need to be fault tolerant and inclusive. All the things that Heidegger's bridges are not. They need to be like in Monet's painting. They foster soft yet connective stability, linking disparate nodes without obscuring the radiance of each flower, every lily pad, every willow, and every bulrush. Rather than fracturing the scholarly landscape or the human landscape, this bridge reminds us that the boundaries of knowledge are porous and permeable, much like the connections that link the vast array of vital phenomena of our planet and its systems. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mays, Rabbi Mays. Um, if you have time for questions and comments, uh, I love that it. Be... Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So um, if you are currently in the room, uh, please raise your hand, either your physical hand if you're on camera or the little virtual hand. If you missed the invitation to become a panelist uh, or you came in a little bit later, please raise your hand and I will pull you in and then you can ask a question. Beth? Thank you, Rabbi. This is really more of a comment than a question. I love the idea of thinking of environmental degradation as slow violence and then countering that with the admonition that we must seek peace above all other things. I think that is a wonderful way of thinking about this and sharing it and moving things forward. And I, I thank you for making that connection. Thank you. Yeah, I, I became aware of Bob Nixon's work a few years ago when I gave a presentation and someone told me, you're thinking in Talmudic terms about what, someone who wrote a very good book about this. Um, you should go read that book. And all of a sudden, I reread the Sugiot and Bava Kama in a totally different way. 
Um, and then when I was, you know, when I was asked to give this talk tonight, I was thinking about how to tie it into Hanukkah. And like so many things that feel like they're serendipitous, they really actually are, because I realized that that passage at the end of the Rambam's formulation about Hilchot um, uh, Megillah or Hanukkah is a kind of... Um, it's almost like a manifesto for what halacha could be as an agent for peace. And that if we think about the Torah of al Pei as a force that um, that is about uh, how do you make those thorny, complicated decisions, which, you know, there it's you have to buy Hanukkah candles or Shabbat candles. In our world, it's infinitely more complicated. But when faced with an easy problem, a complicated problem, or a wicked problem, Rambam's admonition is clear. It's not about the bottom line. It's about how do you create an illuminated space within that house? That's what it's about. So uh, there's a question in the chat that I would like to raise. This is from Jack Wasserman. What if I and others do not share this apocalyptic slash catastrophic view of environmental change? It's a great question. Um, I don't often use the word apocalypse, and that's for a lot of reasons. One, <laughs> um, you know, apocalypse is tied to a particular kind of literature about the revelation of knowledge. We have this in the book of Daniel. We have this in the books of Enoch. We have this in a book that we spawned, but we don't claim canonical, um, content, uh, canonical claims to, um, the book of Revelations. On the other hand, I think a way that apocalypse functions for a lot of people is exactly the kind of crisis that um, Kyle White is talking about. It's the end of my world. And the end of my world is, is terrifying. Um, I think that we should be not terrified, but I think that we should be, um, we should be aware and that we should have our eyes open, and that we just don't know. I think rather than apocalypse and catastrophe, I would say that what we need to be doing is building up, it's like what, um, in surfing, there's a metaphor that people use with one another, which is that if there's a lot of surface chop, if everything at the surface feels like it's impossible to hold on to, you go into the deeper water. And so the deep waters of Judaism provide us with an anchor, because whether you subscribe to a vision of ap apocalypse and catastrophe um, or not, the world is extremely uncertain, and it's more uncertain now than it has ever been in my life. And I, I think that since I remember as a child watching the collapse of the Berlin Wall, I've never been more, not just more uncertain about this world. And Anna Tsing in her book about living um, like a Matsutake mushroom says the twin banisters of modernity, um, on the one hand, a stable geopolitical order, and on the other hand, um, a stable climate are both what are kind of being taken away from us at the same time. And she wrote this long before the war in Russia and the fact that we are in a time of really, really complicated international politics at the same time as watching and Again, the science I think here is fairly clear. I, as a native Californian, watched the erasure of forests from my landscape. I have said goodbye to species that I used to live in community with and no longer do. I have watched a landscape transform. And so that uncertainty, which I bequeath to my children, is kind of like what Barbara Kingsolver describes in one of her books, um, watching a child run toward a sandcastle at the edge of the ocean, and you don't know which gate, what, what wave is going to crash over it. You just don't know. But you see how beautiful that future could be, and also the question mark next to it. I see that Beth has her hand up again. Uh, is anyone else? Uh, I, I've noticed some cameras popping on that weren't on before. Um, so if you are looking to express a question, feel free to raise your hand, put it in the chat. Um, okay, so we do have 
a couple more questions coming in uh, to chat, uh, and then we'll come back to Beth. Thank you. Um, from Justin, uh, who have you built bridges with? Have you established common ground with those who disagree on the fun fundamental basis of science and our current experience? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> complicated question. Love it. Um, you know, so many academics uh, talk about building bridges and um, sitting with different opinions and they kind of like only hang out with people that reify their own ways of looking at the world. And I think that Facebook and other kinds of social media um, have played into that in that they only show us things that either support our worldview or make us really upset and then support our worldview that way. Part of the reason that I love everything from community teaching to academic life is that um, you come into contact with people who don't share any of your fundamental assumptions. So I think that that's actually critical and key to what we're doing. And in the moment in which people don't like to think about things in different ways, and in a socio-political moment, as well as an academic moment in which people are more comfortable to sit in their own particular Dalet Amot, or their sort of like four L's of their own worldview, I think this is the critical work, whether that is across political lines or uh, another bridge that I sometimes am rebuffed at is when I show up to climate conferences and people say, why are you talking about religion? We have all the fixes that we need. Um, not to make invidious statements about my home institution, but if you look at the new School of Sustainability at Stanford, and you look at where the humanities are in that new school of sustainability, and then you look at where the school of where religious studies is within that, in that it is almost entirely absent from this enormous new institution that tells you that religion is being entirely sidelined from these conversations. And that to me is a critical way of thinking about how can I, can we, can those of us who believe in the power of, um, of religion to be a force for challenge and for galvanizing um, new ways of thinking, we have a strong case to make for our relevance to to those who think that this is only a scientific problem. And here I think that Mary Evelyn Tucker's statement that the climate crisis is a crisis of the human spirit and not just a crisis of science is a really important one and also a hard one. So I love to hang out with people who don't share my assumptions. I try to end up in those conversations, <laughs> whether it's family members or friends or um, or non-fellow travelers that I meet in the academic world. And um, I find that to be very uncomfortable and hard work, and also part of what it means to be a Jew, what a part it means to be a citizen, and part of what it means to be a someone who hopes to fight for a different future. And yeah, I don't gain a lot of traction in the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox worlds um, for the same reason, and that's why I think it needs to be um, it needs to be a mutual conversation. So we have uh, an interesting question from Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, if you would like to clarify, uh, she asks, uh, Rabbi Mays, do you envision a tipping point of some kind? I'm wondering if this is an ecological tipping point or a tipping point for any subset of the Jewish community to respond to this issue in a deeper way. Jennifer, if you'd like to clarify. Oh, sure. I am indebted. What a brilliant tour de force of a lecture. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi Mays. Um, I, I'm wondering if you envision, I would suppose I'm referring to uh, the physical state of the world, you know, where climate change reaches a tipping point. Uh, all of these uh, things you were you have said um, are endangered. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't think, from my understanding of the science, that tipping points are the most helpful rubric. Um, there was the, you know, the baseline of two hundred and eighty parts per million of the carbons in the atmosphere before um before the industrial revolution then there was the marker of 350 and 400 425 500 um some of which are in the rear view mirror some of which we're coming up on 
I think that the climate systems modeling, from my understanding, again, is so much more complicated than tipping points allows us to think that that's actually not the most helpful way. It's not like a Jenga where <laughs> my kids love to play Jenga and it's so annoying because everything comes collapsing down on our floors. Um, you pull out one and another and another and then it all collapses. I think it's actually much more complicated. It's more like if you were to um, to to build a to build a um, a Lego castle in which none of the connections are infrangible. They don't just click into place, but they all sort of rest with each other. And then to slowly just start moving the table, right? We have an Ikea table, so it just kind of moves <sighs> forth. And it's that, and you just, you don't know which and how many, and the factors are so complicated. So definitely, I think many of those tipping points are already in the rear view mirror. And there are some that we are moving forward, but you know, it's kind of like when you move from thinking about two dimensions to three dimensions, and then someone's like, well, then maybe there's a fourth dimension. Now there's like nine dimensions. Um, it's it, That's why it's such a hard problem and why people talk about it in the terms of being a wicked problem, because it's not just mm -hmm. one thing. Um, and the implications of all the different ways that that can play out are so complicated. Um, we just, we don't know, which is again, I think going back to the question of, you know, are we talking about apocalypse? I don't know. Mm -hmm. We're certainly talking about a world which will be in some ways complicated and unrecognizable than the world that I inherited from my parents. And mm -hmm. so the theological challenge, the challenge of halacha, the challenge of the humanities, the challenge of Jewish living, the challenge of, of our day is to think not only well, how can we find the tipping point? And then how can we prevent us from moving beyond that tipping point? But is how do we find deep footing? Mm -hmm. How do we find deep connection to the other people around us, to the water beneath us, to the earth beneath us, when we live surrounded by question marks? Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Thank you for your patience. Uh, please go ahead. I, I wanted to make a comment with regard to language like apocalypse and catastrophe. One of the things that I think is a common misunderstanding about the environmental changes that we're facing is that we human beings are not going to destroy the planet. What we are doing is we're just, we're fouling our own nest and we're destroying our own habitat. If ever we are gone, just wiped off of the face of the earth, the earth will continue to evolve as it has from when it first coalesced out of stardust and the earth itself will move on to some other type of climate, some other type of habitats, but it won't be ours. It'll be for some other creatures that will arise. So the issue isn't really saving the world, it's saving us and all the animals and plants that we cherish around us. And it's just my opinion. I, I think if we can frame the issue that way, mm -hmm we're ruining our own nest, that we're fouling the nest, I think maybe it's a little more understandable for people. That's just my thought about that. Thank you. Yeah, look, I mean, the world is a, you know, complicated and beautiful and resilient entity whose complexity we don't even begin to understand. It is true that, you know, even if we were to shift out of carbon-based fuels um, yesterday, there will be implications for anywhere between the next 100 and 10,000 years, depending on the climate model you're using in terms of temperature and in terms of um, um, of the climate of the planet. Um, it's also true that, and here's, I think, the anthropocentric net nature of this question, I think, is really helpful. Um, you know, people talk about how should we how should we describe this time? Some people call it the capitalist scene. Some people call it the... Um, the Plantatio scene. Some people have called it the um, Cthulhu scene, uh, which is Donna Haraway's description of thinking with animals and all these complicated beings that we uh, share the, uh, the world with and the deep time that we need to be thinking with. And I think the Anthropocene is not totally unhelpful, even if it's also problematic. Um, we live in a world in which
starts the question is the endurance of human civilization. And this project that God has started and been involved with of the creation of human beings and human culture and our role as progenitors of that, our roles of continuers of that, and our roles, our role as stewards of that, of tenders of that sacred garden, it is to a certain degree really about the continuation of this story of us, indeed. Okay, so with that, um, I would again like to thank Rabbi Dr. Ariel Evan Mays for just a tremendous, wonderful class. Um, and uh, I, <laughs> I myself was a little surprised by the connection to Hanukkah, but I'm very much looking forward to thinking more about uh, what kind of home I would like to uh, dedicate for myself in this world. Uh, and thinking bigger about that. And of course, I would like to thank again, uh, Alyssa Shea-Ordan and Daniel Ordan for their dedication and sponsorship of the Bow Memorial Lecture in honor of their grandparents. It's been tremendous. And thank you to everyone here who has been participating in our learning community. Your questions and comments always make things go a little deeper, make things a little more rich. We will be sending out a recording as soon as, as soon as everything's processed and whatever other resources that Dr. Mays is willing to give us to forward along to you, uh, whether that is his slides or um, additional resources. Uh, so keep an eye out for that in your inbox very soon, God willing. And um, uh, Alyssa, if there's anything additional you'd like to say in closing or no, just, no, we'll just, we'll wish everyone a good night uh, and, Stay warm and be well, and we look forward to learning with you again soon. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Just brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.